presentation, there are, are a lot of things going on, and I'm delighted that we have uh, folks out to, to learn about uh, some of the things impacting curriculum, instruction, assessment, school climate, um, all types of things that are, are impacting our profession. Um, so just by way of introductions, we have just about all of the administrators here in the district, including the um, uh, Director of Pupil Personnel, the Director of Curriculum, our principals from the middle schools are here, the associate principals from the high school, and I'm very pleased to introduce, who wants to stand up and wave to everybody, this is Mr. Chip Dume. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Mr. Dume is currently the principal at Newtown High School, but on March 1st, he will be our new superintendent of schools. So it's a, a, a pleasure to welcome him here. Thanks for being with us, and uh, he's here to learn a little bit about some of the things we've been going through at Emory, um, a lot of which he's aware of as he's been leading a school that's been trying to manage a lot of the change that's been foisted upon us, right? Um, also, I see a lot of teachers here, so uh, thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, and that, while this is going to be a presentation tonight, I, it, to the extent that you need to ask questions, uh, please feel free. And that, you know, if I can't answer it directly, maybe some of my colleagues will take a crack with the mic or one of the teachers can give you their perspective. So we can try to make this as conversational as we need to. Otherwise, um, sit back and, you know, hear a little bit about the business of education and uh, uh, the impact of a lot of things that are happening um, around us, a lot of which you're probably reading about um, in the uh, news reports as, you know, as early as today or as late as today. So here are the three things that we're going to review tonight. Um, we're going to review how the following things, which many of you have probably heard of, are impacting us at the local level, right? We're going to talk about what are called the Common Core State Standards, talk about new standardized testing requirements, you know, and standards is the root word for standardized. Standardized assessments are those tests that measure our students' performance against the standards. And then how a lot of this is playing into new guidelines that are as part of teacher and principal evaluation. I'll start by saying this. These are not, none of these behind me are not local initiatives. These are not things that were started by the Region 5 Board of Education. They are not things that were brought forward by any of the uh, local administration. These are all things that are largely um, being directed by the Connecticut State Board of Education and the Connecticut State Legislature. There are, there are lots of things that um, have passed in new laws and uh, new regulations that we've had to respond to. So what well, the perspective I'm going to give you, I'm going to explain them at sort of the larger level, but then I'm hopefully going to put a spin on them that uh, brings uh, life to how it's impacting us here at Amity. Um, it's very timely. We, I promise you, I didn't know this was coming, but it was a very interesting day for this uh, meeting to occur. We handed out three news reports. Um, we had a, a, two, uh, a press release there, um, an article from the Hartford Current, and a letter um, that was uh, included in that uh, article of Hartford Current from Governor Malloy. Um, in those news reports that just came out today, you'll see that uh, what the state is now saying is they're backing off a little bit on what has been, and I can describe it no other way, but a breakneck pace of um, change. Okay? This is my seventh year here at Amity, and it's um, my 20th year in educa public education in general. Um, I was a teacher and an administrator in another district before I came here. I know that you know, in the scope of some people's careers, 20 years isn't a lot. I'm about halfway through. I can make it to 20 more. Um, but I can tell you unquestionably that this year I have seen more change than any year before, and I might even venture to say all of the years prior combined. Okay? We have been faced with a lot of change um, in terms of how we've had to manage our curriculum, how we are assessing, expected to assess our students, and how a lot of that is being used as part of my evaluation and teacher evaluation. So we thought we would hand out those press releases to illustrate that we've been saying, um, as teachers and administrators, you know, that we're concerned about the pace of change, we're concerned about how it's impacting instruction in the classroom, we're concerned about how it's impacting the climate in our schools. And I'm very happy, based on these reports, to say that people are hearing us. You know, people in positions of authority are now beginning to make some adjustments that um, we're going to have to pay close attention to. 
So, let's start with the Common Core State Standards. So what are the Common Core State Standards? Not to spend too much time with them, but if you go to this website here, Core Standards, I'm going to have Mr. Schumann show you that website. Um, you can actually read them yourself. Here is the website, and I'll have them uh, click the English Language Arch Standards there. Okay, and then to be fair, click Reading Literature over on the left side there. Yeah, there you go. And then hold for a second. Okay, so standards are what essentially are the backbone of a curriculum. It's not a curriculum itself, but they standards largely articulate content and skills that students are expected to achieve, and they're organized by grade level. So you can see over here where it starts kindergarten and goes through grade, grade 12. These are a sequential a sequence of, of um, skills-based things that students are supposed to do. So for example, Rob, click on grade eight, if you would. You can look at them yourself. If any of you have an eighth grader, his um, language arts, his English teachers, are probably, and social studies teachers, are working in any of these areas, you know. So just the first one, stop right there, at the top here, you know. They're, they're helping students to, right, right there, cite textual evidence that most strongly supports an analysis of what the text says explicitly, as well as inferences to inform the text. Okay, they're very thick. Okay, but certainly, you know, these are what form the backbone of the curriculum that um, your children in eighth grades, teachers, are working on. Okay, Let's jump back to the PowerPoint. But I point this out to you, it's a resource, it's publicly available, and anybody um, with the internet browser can go online and see them and know that the Common Core State Standards are the standards that Amity has adopted and uses. Jump back to the PowerPoint. Good. Okay, so there are uh, some, just run it as the player. Yeah, good. Okay. okay, so there are some misconceptions about what they are, how they arrive. One of the big misconceptions is that it is from the federal uh, Department of Education. It, it's not. It's, it was actually started by the National Governors Association. And the reason that this happened is because up until this year, every single state had different standards. Connecticut had the frameworks, Massachusetts had their own standards, Florida, Washington, you know, Texas, everybody had their own set of state standards that formed the basis for the curriculum in their schools. So in 2009, the National Governors Association and these organizations got together and said, wouldn't it be better if we were all working from one set of standards? So that if you ever moved from Connecticut to Florida, you wouldn't be exposing your child to an entirely different set of learning objectives. You know, we could have a national set of expectations. So they commissioned this group. Um, it was a relatively small group, but they did seek input from these other organizations to get together and write a whole bunch of common standards, something that all states could work from. A lot of this work was funded by the federal government through um, of the Race to the Top, some of you may have heard. Uh, and that was a big federal grant that was given out to this group that wrote these standards. And these are all of the participating organizations. So they did involve, in some, uh, to some degree, the teachers' unions, the administrators' groups, um, the college board, which is very important to us. That's the group that puts together the SAT um, and our AP tests, and all of these other associations. 44 states, including Connecticut, have adopted these standards, right? which is very interesting. When our students eventually take the Smarter Balanced Assessment, which I'm going to get to, our students' performance will be compared on the same playing ground, the same standards-based, standardized assessment, as students in all of the states except the ones at the bottom. So we'll be able to see how well our kids did compared to students in Palm Springs or LA or Seattle, Washington, right? Um, 44 states now have the same standards. So, in July 2010, the CCSS, that's Common Core State Standards, was adopted by our Board of Education. 
Since then, I should say, really since the 2011-2012 school year, Amity teachers have done yeoman's work working on our curriculum to bring our practices into alignment with the Common Core State Standards. One thing was to, done um, to sort of ease this transition to the standards. Before the Common Core State Standards, Connecticut had our own standards called the Connecticut Frameworks. A group of educators got together and laid out the Common Core Standards and compared them to the Connecticut Frameworks. They did a gap analysis to see what the differences were and how much work this would be to realign our curriculum to these new standards. In English language arts, they found that 80% of the Connecticut frameworks matched the Common Core State Standards. So we weren't too far off. In mathematics, 92% matched. So largely the Connecticut State frameworks matched the Common Core Standards to the tune of 92%. So it wasn't a huge adjustment, it was some adjusting of our curriculum. I will say that in general, the Common Core State Standards do set a very high bar for our students. They are very challenging, um, and they certainly have, uh, uh, did require some curriculum work to make sure that our students are prepared to meet the success on that. How did it impact instruction? In addition to the change in curriculum, the way teachers are teaching at Amity, and many of them are here now, had to shift. They had to refocus some of the way that teachers articulated their curriculum through their instruction. The first thing that came out was that it is an expectation now that not just English teachers, but also <coughs> science, social studies teachers of technical subjects, are also teachers of literacy. Okay. This was because, and a lot of research was done on this, in the past, when people would ask, who teaches children to read, right? Especially at the high school level, seventh, eighth grade, who teaches kids to read? The answer would largely be, well, the English teachers teach kids to read, right? That would be the, the, the default answer. English teachers teach kids to read. Social studies, science teachers teach social studies and science. English teachers teach kids to read. And part of that was true. But here was the, the rub. What do English teachers use to teach kids to read? Fiction. Teachers do an awful lot of reading in the area of fiction. The problem is that, what is the diet of reading that most of us in this room do every day? Nonfiction. Right? We might enjoy a good summer read, a good novel you know, at the beach, but the majority of our reading is in news, it is in nonfiction, it is through email, it is through communication. So what we were finding is that while we were preparing kids to read you know, that Stephen King novel quite well, we needed to refocus our efforts to make sure kids are also reading as well in the area of nonfiction. So the Common Core State Standards reminded our social studies, science, um, and technical subject teachers that their input into teaching kids to read is as important as the work of our English teachers. That's the first shift. Second shift. It reminded us that we have to make sure, and we've done lots of curriculum audits, to make sure that we have a balance of 50-50 literature and nonfiction in the whole scope of a student's experience at MBA. And I think it's 80-20 at the middle school? 70, 30, so it's 70% fiction, 30% nonfiction, right? Okay. So that by the time the kids get to high school, at least half of what they're reading needs to be nonfiction and half to be fiction. And it's 70% uh, fiction middle school, 30% nonfiction for our grades seven and eight. So that was the second shift. We needed to conduct an audit of everything our kids were reading to make sure we're hitting this ratio. The th Across all classes. Right. So English is probably where students are getting the bulk of their fiction reading. History, social studies, science, uh, art, applied education, uh, uh, family consumer science. That counts towards the other half. 
Make sense? Okay. Here's another big shift. Lots of research was done that said, they looked at surveys of textbooks used at the high school and the diet of reading done at the high school, and they found a gap between the level of difficulty of that reading at high school and what students were being exposed to in freshman year of college. They said that we needed to go back into everything we're asking kids to read and adjust what we're asking them to read to make it more difficult, to ramp up the level of challenge in all of that uh, text, and that's about text complexity. So, this behind me here, the way that we determine what students are reading, the grade level, is one way, there's plenty of others, there's other indexes and, and scores you can give it, but the most common one is called a Lexile score. You can score something with a Lexile, and, and it's a, a metric that takes into consider text complexity and from a quantitative dimension, qualitative dimension, and the reader task purpose. But generally, out of that score, if something was scoring in this old Lexile range, at the you know, 960 to 115, it would be considered a 9th or 10th grade text. Now, under the Common Core, we're expected to increase that to that level. So we had to do a lot of replacing of our resources and materials to make sure that the level of challenge in those texts was more complex. So that's required a lot of work. Again, our teachers have done yeoman's work going through their curriculum and making sure that students are reading at the appropriate grade level. A lot of this work was done with our reading teachers and essentially a lot of the resources and materials we've used in the classroom has had to shift, some of it we've had to get rid of, to make sure that what kids are reading is appropriately complex. The fourth thing, of course, this is a, a um, I'll go through this quickly here. When teachers are asking kids questions on um, tests for, to respond to short answer essays uh, as a part of multiple choice, we need to make sure that 80% of the questions are text dependent, okay? Basically, this goes to um, this standard. We're asking students to um, read to, uh, and write to inform and write to make argument. The days of personal narrative should be minimized. Let me see if I can put it to you this way. We may care a lot about our students, and we do, but until they win a Pulitzer Prize or a Nobel Prize in something, we should care less about what they think about something and more about how they can cite from the research and write to persuade, not from their personal opinion, but from the text. Right? We need students to have skills not to come in and write us an essay all first person about what they think about something, but what we want is them to be able to um, go to resources, vet those resources, and then write persuasively from those resources and minimize their personal opinion. So teachers are no longer asking kids, what do you think? Now teachers are asking them, what do the experts think? Make an argument, you can have your opinion, but back up your opinion with the research of the experts. So essentially we're asking them to, I guess you'd say, um, think like a detective and write like an investigative journalist, right? We're de-emphasizing first personal narrative and emphasizing research-based um, uh, uh, thoughtful um, information and argument. And then of course, this parlays into a lot of what especially is happening, I see it all the time, in our social studies and our science classes where students are being asked to do an awful lot more research. Um, and of course, that we are in this digital age, a lot of work is being done um, in the area of 21st century skills that involves media and technology. So those are the shifts in the English language arts standards. In mathematics, there are these six process standards, and I'll just go quickly through this part here. At the high school level, here are the categories that students are working in, and here, this is probably the most helpful for you all to see. Math has had to make dramatic shifts in their curriculum. Next year will be the last year that we offer pre-algebra at the high school. 
it is a new expectation that all students are finishing eighth grade having successfully completed algebra. That's new, and that's taken an awful lot of work at the middle school level to get those students up to speed. Right? And part of this has to do with realignment of some of our core courses and lots of curriculum work to make sure that kids are completing algebra so that they can start with that background at high school. So you can see over here at the high school, the standards are grouped into this number and quantity algebra, functions, geometry, statistics, and probability category. And then from K-12, you can see how the student progresses to be prepared for those particular standards. Okay. And here are the priority standards for each grade level up to senior year. Or, excuse me, freshman year. Okay. So here's going to shift now from Common Core State Standards into testing. These standards, our students are going to be expected to demonstrate mastery of these standards on new assessments. The Connecticut frameworks were assessed by tests called the CMT, which in Region 5 were administered in grades 7, 8, and 10. Okay? Because we are no longer teaching the Connecticut frameworks, we are no longer administering those tests. Right? So your kids in here, um, unless they're seven, have all actually taken CMT um, or uh, CAPT if you have a junior or senior, that's going away. CMT and CAPT is gone in the area of mathematics, reading, and writing. The only area where CMT and math are staying are in the area of science. And that's because science is actually looking at these new standards called next generation, and we'll see if those come along uh, anytime soon. Yep. Did I put that there? Okay, sorry. So, right. So, grade five, eight, and ten. I didn't put five, eight, and ten in the uh, the second bullet there. We'll take the Connecticut Academic Performance Test. So that's the last one. So, CMT and CAPT are gone. With that, we have new standardized assessments. And here they are. They are called, and this is a a, a new learning curve for us. They are called the Smarter Balanced Assessments. They're called SBAC for short. So this year, in the area of English Language Arts and Mathematics, all students in Region 5 are going to take, uh, excuse me, grade 7 and 8 in Region 5, are going to take these SBAC assessments. For the first time, our juniors are going to have to take these. So I just taped a message for our junior class, and then we're going to be uh, uh, screening it during our Spartan seminar next week, where I'm going to tell the juniors that they have to take this pilot SBAC assessment. Now, for that, I'm sorry. Our juniors worked very hard to prepare for the CAPT, which they took last year, and they did remarkably well. Our school was identified as a school of distinction by the Connecticut State Department of Education, and we've been uh, nominated for some national awards based on how well our juniors did. Now I'm going to have to ask them to do it again this year. They are going to take that assessment this March. It's over four days. It's about eight hours of testing, and it's all on the computer. Um, it is not, though, however, going to be used as part of any college or university admissions requirement. It is not going to be a part of their academic transcripts. We're not even going to get the data until next fall, I believe November sometime. It's not going to be used as a part of teacher or principal evaluation, and it's not going to be used to rank schools. Essentially, you know, say how well Amity's doing compared to say Newtown or Greenwich or Madison or Cheshire or any other schools in our reference group. Next year, for this year's sophomores, it will count. Okay, we believe that you know, things, of course, are subject to change and are changing quickly. Um, this year's sophomores will take the Smarter Balanced Assessment and it will be the first year of the real deal. So this year's sophomores are going to take the CAP Science and then they're going to take the SBAC. But we do not know whether it's going to be considered a graduation requirement. We do not know if those scores will be included as part of academic transcripts and reported to college or university. 
Based on today's news, we do not believe it will be a part of principal or teacher evaluation, at least for next year. Who knows about the years to come? And we do not know if it will be used to um, identify schools and do any kind of ranking. All of these things are still unknown to us and are going to be decided largely at the state legislature, but also will be a function of uh, Region 5 Board of Education policy deliberations and, and uh, consideration. So putting it all together, here is the testing schedule, standardized testing requirements that students in grades 7 through 12 face at Emory. Okay, so in grade 7, students will take the um, CMT science, correct? No, 8th grade, that's 8th grade. So in grade 7, they're going to take the Smarter Balanced Math, Smarter Balanced ELA, and they'll take the test called the Gates McGinnity, which is a reading screening. It's a reading diagnostic. I'll let Ms. McPadden, uh, Dr. McPadden, excuse me, uh, explain a little bit about that when she comes up and talks about teacher and principal evaluation. In grade eight, I missed one. It should say CMT Science, Smarter Balanced Math and English Language Arts, and Gates McGinnity. <clears throat> grade nine, students will take the Gates McGinnity. Grade 10, students will take the CAP Science and the Gates McGinnity. Grade 11 is a very heavy testing year. Grade 11, students will take the PSAT, they will take the Gates McGinnity, and they will take the Reading and uh, Mathema English Language Arts and Mathematics Smarter Balanced Assessment, and then in grades 12, the Gates McGinnity. Other ones that students will most likely take, probably 98, 99% of our students do, but they are not required. Certainly the SAT, most students take the SAT in the spring of their junior year, and then again, in the fall of their senior year. Students also elect to take, in some cases, the SAT subject area tests, the AP, um, excuse me, the ACT, the advanced placement tests, um, and then we have students who also take the NOCTI tests, which are technical subject area tests, and the world language assessments. It's a lot of testing, okay? Um, we understand it's a lot of testing. We understand that these tests can be very high stakes for students especially in terms of those college admissions requirements. Um, and we understand, and the teachers here probably are not going to nod their heads when I say this, that it puts students under a lot of stress, and it puts our teachers under a lot of stress. Certainly our AP level teachers and others who work tirelessly to prepare students for these. We, we get it. We understand that. Yes, sir? Um, where did these come from, these uh, smarter balance assessment tests? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Smarter Balance is actually the name of a corporate testing company. Okay. It, was, it is one of two. One is Smarter Balance, the other is called Park. And they are the companies that were hired by the common core people to develop the tests that test students' skills against the common core state standards. It's a, a national testing company. And again, if you want to Google Smarter Balanced, you can access their website and certainly get a lot more information about them. So do all the people in Connecticut take the Smarter Balanced? Correct. This, the, with the exception of the Gates, this is essentially the testing requirements for every student across the state. Every student across the state will be required to take the Smarter Balanced. And then, of course, um, uh, the, every student will be required to take the Smarter Balanced and the Captain CMT Science. Those students who are college bound will largely take the PSAT, SAT. Those students who are college bound in AP courses will take the AP test. So this isn't, like I said, none of this is um, a function of local. It's all state and in, in really national testing. Question back here. I apologize if I missed this, but what's the ultimate goal of the testing? I mean, I understand the testing and all, but ultimately, is this to help the students get into colleges? Is it to broaden their Mm -hmm. The SAT, the AP, are certainly used as part of college admissions considerations. No question. SAT definitely, the ACT definitely. The AP are something students choose to take, but that they show up on transcripts with the AP test score is something that admissions offices at colleges and universities across the nation consider. Okay. The smarter balanced, this is where I'm going to say we don't know. For this year, definitely will not, 
be reported to colleges and universities. For next year and the first year, I seriously doubt it will, but I don't know. And in years to come, maybe. You know, as I look into my crystal ball and, and stare down the road, it might well be come the new SAT because it's a national level assessment. Okay? Um, but I can't give you an answer to that. That's just my speculation. Um, every state, I kind of have to go back in history here, there used to be a law called No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind required every state to come up with a testing regimen. Connecticut's testing regimen was CMT and CAPT, which was aligned to the Connecticut frameworks. When we got rid of the Connecticut frameworks and adopted the Common Core, so CAP CMT is to Connecticut frameworks what Smarter Balanced is to the Common Core. So the Smarter Balanced became Connecticut's de facto standardized assessment to make sure that our students are mastering the Common Core standards. Does that make sense? Okay, question back here. Yes, it is a computer test that if a student were sitting in any of those 44 states, the same student would be taking it, which it begs an interesting question. I'll tell you that the first thing we did when we would get CAP scores back in this summer, very first thing we did was say, oh, we did great. How well did Greenwich do? How well did Newtown do? How well did Madison do? How well did Guilford do? we would be looking for a reference to see how well our students did compared to similar schools. What will be interesting in this is now when we get our students' results, we may well be asking, well, how well did the kids in Beverly Hills do? How well did the kids in Palm Springs do? Right? So I imagine that our students' performance, because people love lists and it seems to be how people use this data, will be used to compare Amity's performance not only against Connecticut State, but Massachusetts, Vermont, Nevada, Washington, et cetera. Question. Uh, could you pull back to previous, uh, sorry about that, yeah. Look like in next year, and um, there's a, for the Smarter Balance um, uh, task, um, so grade 11 doesn't need to take it this year and next year. No. This year's juniors, grade 11, will take the pilot test. It's a practice test. This year's sophomores, when they take it this time next year, when they take it, that's what the next year is, it will be the real deal. It will be uh, action. It won't be pilot anymore. It will be live. It says, it says yeah. No, it does. Oh, I'm sorry. My, that's a mistake. That's an error typo. Oh, good catch. It's 11? 11. Yeah. Oh, I saw this. I must have looked at this 15 times. I'm sorry. That should say 7, 8, 11. Yes? I was curious about the purpose of piloting the test with the juniors um, vis a vis the fact that time is now being taken in the classroom to prepare the juniors. Absolutely. Um, when it has no bearing on anything. That, that is absolutely a fair concern. Um, without question, our teachers are now teaching curriculum aligned to the Common Core standards. They are absolutely preparing students actively now for this assessment. Okay. That's fine. I have no problem yep. with Common Core, mm -hmm. although I will say, I think, you know, at a certain level of academic performance, you start to wonder what's the point. Mm -hmm. but Right. It, it, yes, it, I understand. I understand your point, and um, I can just make one without you know, editorializing too much about this. You're right, and that when and when that is is not this year or next year. When 
SBAC becomes a function of my evaluation and teacher evaluation, I can assure you it's going to become even more of a central focus in the classroom. And, I mean, this may be an inappropriate question and you don't have to answer it if you don't feel comfortable. How do you feel about having standardized testing reflect you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. We're going to punt, right? <laughs> um, I, 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 I've, I have strong feelings about that. Uh, and, and, uh, I have strong feelings about that, and I also have strong feelings about the fact that this test is in the junior year. I think it is poorly placed, that's my feeling, and, and it's just me not speaking as anything more, but the junior year with all of the test prep our kids do for AP and SAT and, and all those things, it seems like the wrong spot for it, okay? Um, so, with that said, I'll let you read between the lines as to how I might feel about whether it's part of my evaluation. Mm -hmm. But it is an amity So that's also a decision on Amity's part to do this. Okay. Partially true, partially not true. We didn't have a choice to say no to the Common Core. The Connecticut State Department of Education threw out the Connecticut frameworks and said, these are our state standards. When they said that, we had to adopt them. Okay, that's one. I so, spoke, I didn't mean Common Core, but the test. Yeah. yeah. For this year, we were given the choice of giving the sophomores the capped, right? And then next year, giving the sophomores the real deal SBAC test. Or taking this year off from capped and giving the juniors the practice, the, the, the pilot. That was a choice we were offered. We made the decision to test the sophomores only with the capped science and then they'll have to do it next year. But we did make the decision, it's true, not to give the sophomores the cap, but to give the juniors the pilot. The reason we did that is because we are no longer following the Connecticut frameworks. Therefore, we feel it's unfair to expect students to take an assessment, a la the cap in CMT, if we're not preparing them for it. So that, that's what informed our, our thinking about that. But it is true, we signed a it, it, was a, it was a form, I can picture it in my mind, it said option A. Sophomores take capped, then when they're juniors they take SBAC for real. Or, sophomores don't take capped, but your juniors have to take the pilot. That was a, we chose that option. Yes, sir. Um, I like to shift from teaching to the test to teaching to the standards. Um, what's your opinion of the Common Core Standards compared to the Connecticut framework? Um, do you think it's an improvement? Do you think it's going to help pedagogy? Or do you think that it's just six of one and a half a dozen of another? Um, in, in the earlier slides, I showed you they matched, right? That the frameworks in English language arts matched 80% of the Common Core Standards, and in mathematics, 92%. So the difference there was about 200 or so newer standards. My feeling about the Common Core Standards is they're pretty good. I mean, if you go online and read them, you know, they talk about students be able to cite textual evidence, be able to speak and listen. Um, you know, they're good, they're, they're, they're fine. Um, I, I have no, I, I, it's not like I would ever say the Connecticut frameworks were superior to the Common Core State Standards. That would be ridiculous because they matched. I mean, they were, they did the gap analysis. They were pretty close. I think most teachers, if you talk to that have read the, the Common Core Standards will say, yeah, they're pretty good, they're tough. And, I can give you one other piece of personal editorial here. I have a son in kindergarten. I have a daughter in preschool. My son will be the first Common Core kid. Okay. He's going to go, starting this year, I see it already. Oh my God, with prompting and support, I must have read the standards a thousand times because I'm obsessed about his education, which I'm sure most of you are about your children's education. But he will be the first Common Core kid, literally, to go through all 12 years because he's going to go to public school. If he can master those standards and meet with success in junior year on that test, and I will be a very happy man. I certainly do see them as preparing students for college and career. So they're, they're, and again, that's my, my humble opinion. Uh, 
certainly I would welcome you to inform your own opinion by going online and looking at them yourself. Any other questions? Someone back there. Excellent question. We are very proud of our AP program here. We are also very proud of our AP results. Our students perform magnificently well on the AP tests, and I have some AP teachers here. If you ask some of the AP teachers, they will tell you that to prepare students for the AP test, they have to cover a ton of content. The AP tests are very content driven. The Common Core standards are more skills based. They, they speak more to skills, whereas the AP certainly gets you deep into the content. I doubt very much that our teachers are making, our AP teachers are going to make any dramatic shifts in their instruction that will put their students at risk of not doing well on the AP test. Our, we have very talented AP teachers, and I'm supremely confident they can do both. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's, you know, now we're going pretty deep into psychometrics, right? Test validity and all of those things. I'll tell you, they have to do a pilot test this year because they want to make sure it's calculated. And that's why they do it. They have, a, I'm sure, a, a group of very talented psychometricians who are people who design tests somewhere that are going to figure this out. There is no way that we can say that this is a valid and reliable testing instrument yet. It will take years worth of data and crunching the numbers to look at to, till we can ever really say that. Um, so it's a, it's a good question. Your, your question is, are these tests valid indicators of student, students' content knowledge and skills? Right now, the answer is no, because we don't know what they are yet. We're still learning about them as educators at the same time the people writing these tests are developing them. So certainly some of the criticism you'll hear about a lot of this is a function of the speed of implementation. It's a great question. Yes? I feel pretty ignorant about these exams. Mm -hmm. And my oldest kid's a seventh grader, so I'm not very experienced with the assessments. But when I compare them to tests that I took as a kid <coughs> understand where all the stress and prep comes from. I feel like when we had an assessment land on us once a year or every year or two, the teachers just kind of said, you've got a test next week. They dropped it on us. We filled up the bubbles and it was done. Like, why is that kind of temperature taking not the way it is? Is it because these tests play such a role in the evaluation of the school? That is a perfect segue question. Okay, You couldn't, couldn't have teed that up for me any better. Without question, making these test results a function of my evaluation and teacher evaluation, which are part of the guidelines that we had to follow when we wrote our new teacher and principal evaluation, has raised the stakes for me and the teachers. Right? I think that's what you're asking. Like, what, what is it about this that's creating a new level of awareness and, and potential concern? Yeah, why can't we just drop the test on the kids one day, check the results, and then that's the way we have historically done it. Now we drop the kids on test on the kids, and you know, per new guidelines, those students' results will reflect to a certain percentage on my efficacy as the leader of this building and the teacher's efficacy of instruction. Certainly, if somebody said to you, your professional um, quality is determined by something in your workplace, it would get your attention pretty closely. And, and without question, this has got our attention. 